Hello, my name is Dr. Matt Moynihan, and I'm excited to uh, give these remarks to the Seattle section of the IEEE. I want to try to keep my talk as short as I can to allow for questions. Usually when I'm on the phone with someone for investment call, um, I just answer questions. And, and I'm going to cover some topics in this lecture that may or may not have been something that you wanted to hear about. So ask me questions about anything. I've been doing this 16 years. So I know Fusion pretty much inside and out. Uh, so start to get some questions together for the end of the lecture. I'm going to start by introducing myself and my consulting firm. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done for clients. We've had a fun couple of years. And then I've broken this into three parts, um, Fusion Past, Fusion Present, and Fusion Future, where we've been, where, we're, where we are, and where we're going. Um, then I'm going to have some concluding remarks. It'll just summarize everything I said, and then we'll have time for questions. So start putting together your questions now in the chat uh, for the end of the talk. Thanks. So I'm going to introduce myself and uh, point you to some good fusion resources. Um, I am a person who believes that we need fusion power to avert the worst impacts of climate change. And I know as I say that, there are people that immediately will contest that because there's other energy solutions. There's wind, there's solar, there's advanced um, fission. Uh, I, I, fusion is shaping up to be a gigawatt class, large scale facility um, that produces no carbon footprint. And so it has a major impact. It's a tool for human civilization that will have a major impact on our carbon footprint collectively. I've been in this field 16 years. I got a PhD in this from 2006 to 2013. Uh, along the way, I've done a lot of cool stuff. I was a blogger, fusion podcaster. I organized the Nuclear Fusion Shark Tank, which was a fun exercise in getting fusion teams in front of VCs and investors to see how that actually works. <laughs> I've written a popular science book, and I was a nuclear engineer for the U.S. Navy looking at the safety of nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers. So I have some foot in the fission world and have some sense of how um, nuclear reactors gets licensed by regulators and which is going to be really helpful going forward into the fusion world. Uh, I started consulting in 2018 and I'm an independent third party consultant, which is helpful for investors because they can hire us without no conflicts of interest, which is really helpful. So for the purposes of this talk, if you hear a talk from, say, Zap Energy or General Fusion, um, they have a specific agenda that they want to push or a framework that they want to push. Me being a third party uh, is very helpful because I don't have an agenda. I can talk broadly about the space um, in general terms. Uh, my, con my consulting firm is New Light Fusion Consulting. We were founded in 2018. Um, initially, it was a side hustle because the market was, wasn't there yet. Um, but it's grown significantly and we went full time in the fall of 21. We offer due diligence on fusion investments. It's a gig business. The way my, my company works is um, when we get a contract in, we can pull from my network and assemble a team with the right expertise to essentially red team the fusion proposal from the startup. So it gives us a nimbleness that we can bring in experts with different expertise to cover different portions. So if you have a laser approach or a magnet approach or a pulse power problem or a target fabrication problem, we can pull together a team that will fit the needs. So we can assemble a team with 100 years of experience uh, in a specific area. Uh, we do also offer a, some standalone products. We have a fusion industry report that covers 25 firms. And we offer joint consulting services with a couple other companies under this Fusion Advisory Services umbrella. So if you're interested or you know somebody who's interested, put them in touch with me. Uh, we love to help uh, new clients with business. These are some of the firms we've done work with. This slide is a little bit old. There's some new logos that would have to be added here. All different projects with different fields. So for instance, I can speak about the European Commission one. We looked at for them we did a nine-month study where we interviewed founders of over 25 mm -hmm. nuclear fusion firms um and that was a really interesting work for the defense department we looked at for example we did work with them we looked at spin out technologies from fusion fusion research is like landing on the moon when you get to the moon you also develop along the way dozens and dozens of juicy and important spin-out technologies that have applications in conventional industries 
So it's an exciting time. And then we've also done some work, uh, other work where we just looked at one specific company. So wide set of work, wide set of needs, wide set of customers. Uh, I want to give a shout out to one of my great resources, um, Fusion Masterclass. Uh, it's a YouTube video series that I put together around the structure of my book that's coming out on Amazon uh, in April. And it covers each family of Fusion approaches in plain English for normal people. And it's free. You can stream it off YouTube, in your car, at the gym, uh, when you're cooking, whenever. It's built around all these machine learning AI classes that exist on the web now where you can take a lecture on, on how to do programming or learn AI. But this one is for Fusion. And I highly recommend it. There's a lot of material in here that I can't cover in one lecture. And so I've got this YouTube series. So it's a resource that you can get. And as I said, it's built around the, my book, Fusion's Promise, um, which is another great resource. It's $40. It's on Amazon now for pre-order. Um, I, worked, I worked on it for five years in Pittsburgh with my great co-author, Dr. Fred Bortz. Um, Fred writes science books for kids, so my job was to get the material all organized and peer-reviewed and accurate, and then Fred's job was to take it all the way out to the general reader. So this is fusion for the general population. It's picture-heavy. We have over 200 illustrations and photographs in there, um, so it's it's palatable for normal people, fusion for normal people. And it's also covers a wide swath of the, of the um, field, not just tokamak, not just ICF, but mirrors, FRCs, pinches, um, PGMIF, just any exotic concept. We put it all under one, one big tent and we put it all in this book. So I really hope you buy the book. It, it's been a long time coming. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Melanie Winridge's site, Fusion Energy Insights. Melanie's a great science communicator over in England, and she's got a subscription service that you can sign up for, and you get on her newsletter, you get invited to her Zoom talks and other things where she interviews leader in the, leaders in the fusion industry. So I'd recommend her. I'd also recommend the Fusion Industry Association. I'm a member. Um, it's a great group. It's the voice of a new industry, basically, and they are... Um, engaging with Congress on legislation, so they're the source of all the government actions on fusion. They also support fusion broadly by interfacing them with investors. So they're a really good group. It's really great to see a community of private fusion come together and speak with one voice. And then I'd also want to mention um, two other great sources of Fusion Energy News International. Uh, Tony Galil is putting together a um, advertising service where he's got advertisers paying for page space and then he's covering the fusion uh, space and also fusion energy database which was put together by a friend of mine sam wurzel uh, that's a little bit out of date but it's still got some good resources and good information on it so anyway there are tools and our resources available to learn more about this field and i highly recommend you you do some of your own research okay so let's get to the meat of the lecture <laughs> As I said, it's going to be three parts. It's past, present, and history. So let's start with the past. Where have we been with this field? Fusion is a large, long, complicated field. It's multidisciplinary, and it stretches back over 100 years, if you really want to get specific about when we started work on it. So I'm just going to give you some highlights from the last 100 years of work, and those highlights are kind of going to come in the form of firsts. So the first detection of fusion in a laboratory was done by Dr. Mark Oliphant at the University of Cambridge. Um, what he did was he took a particle of hydrogen and accelerated it down a 600,000 volt potential drop. That accelerated it up to speed where it slammed into another hydrogen. And in the process, the two hydrogens merged. Some of the mass was lost and converted into energy through E equals MC squared. That produced heat and energy. It also produced a hot atom, helium atom, and a neutron. Now, that helium atom didn't stick around. Usually, the results of fusion, when they happen, they just exit immediately. Um, and that's going to be important because we, we want it to stick around to start off secondary fusion reactions. But this was a, this was a big moment, but it's not very useful for a fusion uh, power plant. We're going to zoom ahead about 20 years. The first atomic bomb 
that used fusion as a booster was the greenhouse item test in May of 1951. Um, atomic bombs, fusion fission bombs are two part compartments. They have a fission driver which explodes and generates x-rays and then they use that x-rays to implode a secondary capsule of deuterium tritium booster fuel and the greenhouse item test was the first one to do that of course bombs aren't useful for for fusion reactors either so we've got to skip over this point in history the first machine that we could think of as a modern fusion experiment that was successful was actually built by the Americans at Los Alamos in the end of 1957. Um, there's actually a whole history here. In the early 50s, Argentina claimed that they had a fusion uh, device uh, and that turned out to be bogus. Um, and then the British were in the race and they built a machine called Zeta. And in August of 57, or the summer, they claimed that they had gotten fusion because they detected neutrons from a reaction. But it turned out to be the wrong kind of neutrons. There are two kinds of neutrons you can detect. Beam target neutrons, which are formed from some process, or thermonuclear fusion neutrons, which have a certain energy and spread. The two are different, and one will scale up as you increase the temperature density and time of the fuel. The other will not. And so the British had to very publicly withdraw their claim of thermonuclear fusion. It was a very big embarrassment. And then only a few months later, a team at Los Alamos was able to do it. And they did it with a machine called Scalia-1, which was a metal tube with deuterium gas inside. They pumped current around the outside of the tube and created a magnetic field that crushed the inner fuel to 15 million degrees Kelvin, and they got fusion. It was, it's a theta pinch is what it was. This was a highly classified event. All, nobody knew about it. And the people in the room were Marshall Rosenbluth, who went on to become a very famous plasma physicist, and Jim Tuck, who was involved in the Manhattan Project and then switched to fusion. So we had a major earth shattering mankind historic type event in a highly classified environment in a lab at Los Alamos National Lab. It's very sad that we don't make a bigger deal about that, but that's the situation. Okay, let's, let's zoom ahead about 40 years. <laughs> Today, you can build a fusion device in your garage. For about $2,000, you can build a machine called a fuser. It's a metal cage inside a metal cage inside a vacuum. And you apply a voltage and you accelerate ions across that voltage. They can slam together and fuse. Today, there's about, there's several hundred people in North America, teens, high school students, and amateur hobbyists that have built these things in homes and garages around Canada and, and, and the United States. In fact, there's a group in Seattle that trains high school students on this thing. Um, and the first evidence that I have, and I might be incorrect, but the first evidence I have of that being done was by a gentleman named Richard Hull in his home in uh, Richmond, Virginia. So there's a picture of Mr. Rich, Richard Hull. This is a first for the industry. It's home fusion, homebrew fusion. I thought it was an important thing to mention in the timeline. Okay. The first commercial product that used fusion that I have is a neutron generator that was developed and sold by the company NSD Gradle in 2000. Um, NSD Gradle was a small company founded by John Sved and his wife and a gentleman named Talman Firestone in Europe. Sved was an engineer at Daimler Aerospace and he saw the potential of using fuser-like technology to fuse atoms and create a beam of neutrons um, and sell that as a standalone product. And he did this uh, with NSD Gradle. And for about $300,000, you could buy this neutron generator. And it was a product that did fusion. And it was on the commercial market slice. So the message here is that fusion has been making commercial penetration for already 20 years. We've already seen fusion play out in the commercial marketplace. We haven't seen net power in the commercial marketplace, but fusion has started to make its way to the private market. Okay, let's zoom ahead about 20 years. <laughs> so 
as I said earlier, when when a fusion event occurs, the helium atom is usually so freaking hot, it just exits the plasma. When you model it, you model it as an exit. And that's bad because we want the, the resulting energy generated from the initial generation of fusion reactions to reheat the plasma and start a secondary chain of fusion events, okay? That is called ignition in the ICF community. It's called a burning plasma in the tokamak community. Eater is being built right now in France to get a burning plasma. It would be the first time we'd ever have a burning plasma. The National Ignition Facility was built specifically to get ignition, to get fusion chain reactions to occur. This is a big difference from fission, where the whole point of a fission plant is to control safely and moderate fission chaining events. Fusion doesn't have chaining. So ignition is a fusion chain reaction. And the first evidence of that that we saw was in August of 2021, the 2808 shot on NIF. Um, I was working full time and I, I was on the phone with uh, Mike Campbell, who was the director of the LLE. And we were talking about something totally unrelated. In the middle of the call, he said, guess what, NIF got ignition. And I said, That's, that can't have happened. That can't have happened. It's been 10 years or more. And he said, it happened. So I went back to my computer, hopped on my email and emailed out my network. And I said, I just was told that NIF got ignition by this person, you know, can anyone verify? And then over the next hour or so, I got emails forwarded to me from other people that said, no, this really happened. This really happened. So it was an exciting moment for the field. And then we knew about it and then we didn't see it in the news for a couple of days. I, I, I wanna say it was at least two or three days before we actually saw it in the news. And um, it was exciting. Now, Livermore went back and checked their numbers. And what they got was 0.7 energy out relative to the laser energy on target. And by a definition in the 1997 uh, report for NIF, that was not scientific ignition. The, the paper in 97, it said we will get more than one energy units for the energy on target with the lasers. And so they had to take another year of trying all these different things. And then in December 5th of 2022, they were able to get over one. And that's when um, Secretary Graham Hall came and they organized the big press conference and it made international news and it was on SNL and 60 Minutes and all these other things. So it's kind of funny because the fusion community freaked out about 18 months ago and then the, the rest of the world kind of caught up, <laughs> caught up later when we had this big announcement. But anyway... First evidence of ignition. Okay. This is also an important moment for our field and probably not as big uh, a news event as the ignition shot, but still I think worthy of, of note. Uh, we now have, as of last week, a uh, licensed fusion fission facility here in the United States. And the company that did it was a company called Shine Medical Technology. Shine was founded in 2005 from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And they developed a fusion machine that produced neutrons for 182 hours continuously. They use those neutrons to generate medical isotopes. It's a five to $6 billion global market and probably will grow uh, in the next years. So they wanna use fusion to produce these medical isotopes and sell these medical isotopes. And they started the NRC licensing process in 2011, um, communicating with them in 2011. And then over time, they went through all the hoops and the environmental impact statements and all the phases and all the steps and all, everything the NRC threw at them. And they're almost all the way through the process. It shows that it is possible to get all through all the regulatory crap you have to get through uh, to make fusion uh, reality. And I think if we want commercial fusion in this country, we're going to need to revamp uh, the NEPA law um, and we're going to need, need to revamp the NRC operations. The biggest difference between fusion and fission is that fusion cannot melt down. That's worth saying again, fusion cannot melt down. So 
a lot of the safeguards that are in place for a fission power plant are around that meltdown accident that can't happen. So they must be regulated. They are different. They need to be regulated very differently. That's something I want to get across to anyone who's doing regulations. Okay. All right, let's talk about where we are right now in fusion. Right now, the record for Q, which is the ratio of power in to power out, is 33%. And that record was set by the Joint European Taurus in uh, England at the end of 2021. They put in 100 megawatts or megajoules of energy, and they got 59 megajoules of energy out. Okay, so 33% of net. That's where we are right now. That facility, um, it's a previous generation based magnet technology. These new facilities that are being planned, uh, being built, Spark is being built by CFS, being planned by um, a Tokamak Energy are Rebco based magnets. Uh, and the field strength, the, the fusion rate inside these Tokamaks scales as the, the field to the fourth power. So they get a huge performance boost when they go to higher fields. And also the Rebco facility can run in theory much longer because Rebcos have no, ser no resistance. They can run continuously. So this is going to, this Q record is going to, going to be broken. I think almost surely in the next few years when spark turns on, they're going to, they're going to shatter this Q record, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes. All right. So, there's also a time runtime record. Now, runtime records are a little bit of a fuzzy issue because it's runtime plus temperature. So, for example, Shine has a facility that can run 182 hours continuously. So they have a machine that will fuse for 182 hours continuously. But that's not a record worth noting because it's not a fusion power plant. A good record for time and temperature is um, set by the Chinese. Uh, this facility called East was able to run for 170, 17, 30, 17 minutes and 36 seconds at 126 million degrees Kelvin at the end of 21. And that's a really good, strong record. That's the kind of performance that you would want to see out of a fusion power plant, running continuously at a high temperature, getting continuous fusion. There's another record uh, held by the firm Tokamak Energy. Tokamak Energy was a British startup, is a British startup, that was founded in 2009 around the same sort of premise that CFS was. Hey, if we take a fusion reactor and add a super powerful magnet, we will get these awesome machines that could get net power. And one of the ways they demonstrated this was they built this device that you see here, and they turned it on in the summer of 2015 and they ran for 29 hours continuously, okay? 29 hours continuously. That's a record and it was he it's held by a private fusion company. Um, that's the only private fusion company record I have listed here. Now, Tokamak Energy now uh, ran at 100 million degrees Kelvin uh, last year. So they also have a temperature record too for a private fusion company. Now, I know we were just coming off of the NIF shot where everybody saw the ignition that occurred. Very big news, very international headlines. That shot took um, takes about a day for NIF to do a shot because of all the complexity involved, the maintenance issues, the alignment of the laser, and also the glass has to cool off. When the laser beam goes through these optics, the optics get hot and you have to physically wait for the optic to cool down. There is another type of laser facility called a gas-based excimer laser that was built by the Naval Research Laboratory, and they built an ICF system that can shoot repeatedly. So they have a record for 90,000 shots in 10 hours. Bang, 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 at a rate of 2.5 hertz or every uh, you know 0.4 seconds, it can fire repeatedly. This is an incredible uh, record, and it shows that it is possible to drop targets, blast them, drop targets, blast them, and turn that into a potential fusion power plant. So it's an incredible record, and it was done 10 years ago, which is really sad 
because for 10 years, the NNSA has let the program sort of languish um, because they're not interested in fusion energy. And now with this shot on NIF, there's a renewed, invigorated interest in this field, and they're going to find that NRL has the technology that, that really could go the distance for a fusion power plant. Now, just to add to that, they have another record for pulse power. They have a pulse power system that shot 13 and a half million shots over three weeks. And I, I will spare you the details about the voltages and currents there, but they have a pulse power system that will will get there. Okay. Um, okay, we've talked about the past. Let's change gears and talk about where we're headed now. What does fusion look like tomorrow? I want to tell a story that will illustrate what's going on. Commonwealth was formed in 2017 coming out of MIT. And the reason they did that was because they couldn't get funding for um, this next generation machine that they want to build. And also, um, they they cut the funding for Alcator CMOD. And, and they couldn't get funding for Vulcan, so they decided to go private. They raised $50 million from um, an Italian oil firm called Eni. And then using that seed funding, they were able to then increase that uh, with a Series A round that got them up to about $260 million, $265 million, something like that. With that money, in 2019, they placed the largest order in the history of the wire industry for superconducting Rebco tape. And they put it out to the global marketplace. They tell all their vendors, if you can get us the production volume, quality, uh, on the time scale we need it, you will get this huge chunk of money. And one firm, a firm called SuperOx, was able to meet these, these targets. It was a Russian-Japanese firm. They're headquartered in Moscow. And the way they did it was they SuperOx retooled its manufacturing line um, to do plasma laser deposition, basically um, enabled a 25-fold increase in the production of wire. They made 186 miles of wire in nine months. The wire itself is anywhere from 700 amps per square millimeter up to 1,000 amps per square millimeter. It's, a, it's many uh, hundreds of times more powerful than conventional copper wire. They ship this to Commonwealth. Commonwealth accepts it, that wire and some wire from other vendors, and they wind the largest um, Rebco magnet in the history of the industry. And they turn that on and break a world record for Rebco magnets. They, they got 20 Tesla fields. And this made international headlines. It was a big hoopla. Um, but what gets lost in all the media coverage is the underlying breakthrough in manufacturing. And that I think is more interesting. The fact that this company was able to produce a huge quantity, 25 fold increase in the amount of wire available. I mean, people have wanted to build superconducting Rebco magnets for, for decades, but they never had enough wire or expertise or um, technical know-how on hand to do it. This prevalence of wire is really exciting because wire has other uses. You can take a superconductor, a Rebco superconducting wire and magnet, and put it in conventional technologies like um, magnets, uh, generators, motors, MRI machines, wind turbines, energy storage systems, fast charging systems, transmission lines, computing systems. There are a variety of other places where this wire could be used. So the bottom line is fusion is driving the proliferation of superconductors. And along the way, it's not only doing that, it's addressing many of the problems that have plagued superconductors, including how to weld it, how to um, join pieces of the tape, how to deal with insulation or lack of insulation. There's no insulation systems too. And it's also proliferating this innovation where we're gonna get cheaper superconductors. There's already a number of suppliers that are trying to um, copy what SuperOx did and then try to supply tape to fusion industry. So superconductors might be the most exciting spinoff that comes out of fusion research. 
And I think that's that's really exciting. It, it's sort of like landing on the moon. When you land on the moon, you don't just land on the moon. You develop a dozen or two dozen other products like Tang calculators and other things out of just landing on the moon. Um, and moreover, superconductors can be applied to other fusion approaches, uh, things like mirrors, stellarators, FRCs. So there's other places that superconductors can go. So I think the future of the field looks bright. I think the field of superconductivity and fusion are going to be inexorably tied together over the next decade. One field will drive one, the other field will drive the other. The two are connected. And that's why I think as these powerful magnets proliferate out into the fusion field, we're going to start to see 15, 20 Tesla mirror machines. We'll start to see powerful FRC machines. We'll start to see tokamaks that are within the range of net power. And that is really exciting. So that's with that, I'm going to call it there. Thank you for your time. Just in summary, fusion has a large complex history. I can't cover it in one lecture. I'm sorry. Um, we have a lot of technical achievements to be proud of. We're very close. We're also on the commercial marketplace now, and we've been on the commercial marketplace for decades. And superconducting magnets are a key driver that fundamentally underpin this field, and they will also proliferate into other fields. And that may be the most relevant thing to a bunch of electrical engineers, <laughs> how to think about it. And I think that net power is very, very close. I think within the next decade or so, we'll see it. I think the most likely candidate is, is Commonwealth Fusion Systems, but there are other firms out there that are saying they're going to get there too. Um, Com uh, Tokamak Energy notably is further along technically, and they're out there now funding for a raise. So there's a lot of exciting things. Anyway, I would love your questions. Please ask me anything. Um, what we covered is sort of limited, but I can also talk about a whole lot of other topics. ICF systems, target manufacturing, lossing criteria, history, nuances, sort of the funding situation, what, what investors ask me when they want to talk about this stuff. Uh, please bring your questions. Thanks.